But amino acids, like individual protein letters, link up to form peptides, so short chains or longer chains that fold up, that is proteins. They do so using their amino parts and their carboxylic acid parts. And so they're no longer amino acids, and so we still need a way to refer to them, so we call them residues. We, it's really important that we have a way to refer to what's left over, those things that a minute ago were amino acids, because although they've lost that amino and the acid part, they still have their unique part, their side chain of the R group. This is the part of each amino acid that is unique. So there are 20 common amino acids and each of them has one of these unique side chains. Some of these are small, um, like glycine. Some of these are big and bulky, like tryptophan. Some are negatively charged, things like aspartate and glutamate. Some things are positively charged, things like arginine and um, lysine and histidine. And so because these amino acids have these different side chains, the residues are going, what's left over when they link together, what's sticking off of those chains, those are going to be different still too. And we're going to need a way to refer to them, but we can't call them amino acids. And so now we refer to them as residues because it's the residuals it's the stuff that's left over. And so in the context of a protein or in the context of a peptide, the things that a minute ago we would be talking about as amino acids, we now are talking about in terms of residues. The terms residues and amino acids are often used interchangeably, although technically when they're linked together, well now they're no longer amino acids and we call them residues. So this might just seem like another one of those scientists being all jargony things. But I think that this technical distinction is actually important because it helps you remember that in the context of a peptide or in the context of a protein, the side chain of an amino acid might act differently than it would in the free amino acid form. So with this, I'm talking about things like acidity. So how likely something is to give up a proton. So is that aspartate, um, is that aspartic acid going to be in its negatively charged aspartate state? Or is that um, lysine going to be positively charged? These charges are going to depend on whether or not these side chains have given or taken protons. And this is going to depend, their willingness to give and take protons is going to depend on the context they're surrounded in. So the PKA, their willingness to give up a proton, their acidity, um, is going to depend on the context. And so they're going to have a different PKA day in the presence of um, other amino acids around them than in just the free floating form. Similarly, things like nucleophilicity, so how likely something is to react with an electrophile. And so if these terms don't make sense to you, um, there's more in other posts, but don't really worry about it for now. Just know that there's these different properties of the side chains. Different side chains will have different types of reactions that they can participate in, different types of bonds and interactions that they can form. Um, but these are going so these are going to be dictated by the what they can potentially do is going to be dictated by the atoms that they're made up of, by the carbons, the hydrogens, the nitrogens. But then whether they're actually participate in those reactions, whether they're actually form those bonds, whether they'll be positively charged or negatively charged, whether they're going to be nucleophilic and they attack things. This is going to depend on the context that they're surrounded in. And so in different environments. The side chains on these residues could act differently than they would in the amino acid form. So this is just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about amino acids in isolation versus residues in a protein. And so although we typically often still refer to them as amino acids when they're in proteins or when they're in um, peptides, if we refer to them as residues, it kind of helps us remember that they might be acting a little differently than we'd expect. Um, just over on the topic of some terminology, I know that we talked about amino acids as having an amino part um, and a carboxylic acid part, um, but this carboxylic acid group is only really in this carboxylic acid form, so the form where it has this OH, this protonated form, this is the carboxylic acid form. And at physiological pH, so like in our body, it's going to be in this deprotonated form, this carboxylate form, this conjugate base. And so don't worry too much about this terminology, just know that technically when you see an amino acid, um, if you were to see it like floating around in your body, it would be in this what we call the ionic form where it has a positive part and a negative part, but they cancel out. And so in this case, we're going to have this amino group that's going to be protonated. Um, and then this carboxylic acid group is going to be deprotonated to this carboxylate form. And this is typically how you would actually like find an amino acid, although often we see it on in this form um, with this neutral form. 
um, which isn't really a thing. So if you want more on that rant, I have much more in other posts, but just know that typically you see them drawn like this, but the reality is more like this. Um, but then all of that is when we link them up, you're only going to have that free carboxyl group um, and that free amino group at the end, whereas in the um, in the middle, you're going to have just the residue, so just the remainders left over. So each of these things we would refer to as a residue, in their individual form, we refer to them as amino acids. We link them up, and now what's left over, the parts that came from each individual amino acid, now these are residues. And at one end, we have a free amino group. At the other end, we have a free carboxyl group. And so this we can fold up to form a functional protein. And the function and the um, structure of that protein is going to be dictated by the amino acids that make it up. And those amino acids, although they have sort of like intrinsic properties, are, um, the way that they behave is going to depend on the context they're around. And so when we think about residues, we can think about the, them as being in the context of a full protein or of a peptide. And therefore, that can help us remember that they might be acting a little differently than those calculate than the um, like the values that were calculated for them if they were being studied in isolation. Um, so residues, when they uh, when they linked up, the remainders, the residual stuff. Amino acids when they're free floating. Um, but often we just refer to these as amino acids, even though we're talking about residues. When we're talking about residues, often what we're really referring to is the side chains, these R groups, these unique parts, and not the generic parts, the backbone that they link up through. That's well, that's the same for all of them. So it's not that interesting, right? except that it does help give the protein its form and it's a major source of structure and stuff like that, but it's not each acid or each residue. So hope that helps you understand.